Welcome everybody to the Intellectual Diversity Podcast. I'm John Tangney and my guest today is Tobias Churton, who is the author of uh, many books, including The Spiritual Meaning of the Sixties, um, Alistair Crowley in America, Deconstructing Gurdjieff, uh, Occult Paris, The Lost Magic of the Belle Epoque, and uh, the book through which I got to know you, which was this book, Gnostic Philosophy. Uh, which I, I read a few years ago, and uh, you're, you're also somebody who has a degree in theology, I think, and who lectures at the University of Exeter. And um, w when I got in touch with you about doing this podcast, you were you were somewhat nonplussed that anybody would think of you in the context of diversity. And uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> true. <laughs> I, I'm curious to know why that was. Um, simply because it's, it's such an unusual, it, it's something that I think about, um, but I didn't think anybody else was thinking about it. Okay. I, I, my, my impression is that I've always felt rather, uh, out on my own, mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in that I don't share the, uh, the entire paradigm of the kind of the basis of the education that I received. Um, when I was at Oxford particularly, but obviously well before that as well. I'm, I, not that I, I have a, a tremendously integrated alternative paradigm, but I'm, I'm very skeptical of uh, assumptions about the nature of being that are, uh, have become in this country, in the United Kingdom, have become very common and in fact more intense uh, in the last 20 years, I think, yeah. where uh, certainly my kind of uh, premises that the universe becomes interesting when you regard spirit as the primary reality and not matter. Um, I, I'm really out on my own. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And because I'd also, I don't work with it within any creedal basis. I'm not, I'm not working from, from any uh, church or uh, from any fixed standpoint. So I regard myself as an independent theologian. Mm -hmm. amongst other things okay and um yeah so you you describe yourself as 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 being at odds with the dominant paradigm in the academy which was one of the things that recommended you to me uh that i perceived from your book but what do you think of that dominant paradigm as being well fundamentally it's 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 materialistic it's materialism mm -hmm. uh you know you can call it by any other names uh, but it boils down to the idea that matter is the primary reality. It's post Hume, it's post John Stuart Mill, it's, it's all of that. Uh, logical positivism and so on. It's uh, consciousness is the only um, indication of being. Uh, all, 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 uh, a whole host of allegedly enlightenment uh, mm -hmm. viewpoints. It's, it's, it's ironic that the word enlightenment has come to denote this materialist philosophy that you describe, because it's a word that I think has a much longer history going back through um, both Christianity and... Well, yes. I mean, what's the, what's the motto of Oxford University? Dominus Illuminato Mea, Lord enlighten me. I mean, yeah. <laughs> says it all. Um, yeah, I, I remember Gillis Quispel, who was a, a famous uh, Dutch theologian and expert mm -hmm. on the Gnostic uh, movement of the of anti late antiquity, and also a friend of Carl Jung, who preserved the gospel of truth and put it in his hands, put it in Jung's hands. He said to me uh, one afternoon, he said, the enlightenment was a blackout. Right. Um, yeah. You know, and I, I, it's very rare to find anybody who knows what he meant by that. I, yeah. it, it made immediate sense to me. I, th I think there was a, a, a complete switching off of the higher faculty. It's when uh, you want all the benefits of noose, but you, lo you lodge them in the rational framework. Mm -hmm. in, in Kabbalah, you have this distinction between the Ruach and Neshama. There's a higher spiritual mind mm. um, and, and there's the reasoning faculty. And uh, I think of uh, Chomet, who, who wanted reason worshiped in Notre Dame during the French Revolution. Of course, his friends in the revolution guillotined him not long afterwards, but it wasn't for that particular crime. <laughs> they had to invent another one. Uh -huh. um, so yes, it's this, this thing about the age of reason. 
And what do we mean by reason? I'm, I was thinking of Plotinus, um, Basileus Honus, the, the higher, it's been translated as the higher reason is king. Um, we, we, we can, the rational faculty can only work on, on what is uh, revealed, what it, what, I, I hesitate to use the word revealed, what is apparent to it. So mm -hmm. it's fact based. Mm -hmm. And this is all right uh, if, it's, if you're working in a limited um, uh, area of activity, if, if all the factors in a, in, a, in a procedure are known, then the rational faculty by itself is perfectly adequate. Um, but what could be more irrational than human nature? Yeah. As I've just seen an example of in the House of Commons uh, last night. <laughs> yeah. What are your uh, What are your feelings about that? Are you pro? Yeah, well, I think I think that uh, Theresa May is a, is 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 a, a tremendous uh, uh, person, but mm. she has uh, not factored in uh, the nature of human beings. Mm. As, as how incredibly unenlightened they usually are. And uh, their utter inability to move from one position to another or, uh, or see a greater good than the, you know, they, it's like, it's, it, it's rather, looking at the House of Commons last night to me was like looking at caged animals. They all seem to be in their own cages and um, unenlightened. But I think the whole process has been dogged by this. The, the complete inability to see what the, the, the Brexit thing was really all about. It's and, remarkable to me. And what was it really all about? Well, it was the, in my, in my estimation, it was a revelation of the true will of the mm. country. Okay. It was, it was this, uh, it is a historic suspicion of the United Kingdom of bureaucratic control from outside it's like it's bad enough what we have of our own but to impose a whole new level to it i can't understand how any uh, liberty loving individual can possibly want to be governed by several governors yeah uh, uh and and the that that was always my objection to it even when it was we joined in 75 and i what just wasn't quite old enough to vote then but yeah. i'd have voted not to go in for that reason and it was obvious also then that there was a lie being taught that it was a, a trade agreement essentially with some political implications, but they were all pacific. They were all about um, harmony. Uh, they were all about securing a post-war uh, peace and all that sort of, it was all the very fairy dust stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but nobody was told blankly and openly, except there were a few voices. Peter Shaw, funnily enough, of the Labour Party made an important speech that didn't get much Airplay in 75 saying you've got to understand this is a political uh, union this is even to call its ultimate end a federation would be too too kind it is it is the creation of a new kind of europe uh, european i never felt like i was a european uh, and and ultimately it's an assertion of identity i think brexit really yeah uh, I, I, I mean i can see the same the same problems in russia uh, where you have uh, this idea of, of what is a Russian, you know, what is the identity, what, you know, you can understand, I can understand much better, I think, than most people I speak to about the appeal of, of, uh, of the current regime in, in, in Russia to ordinary people, because there's an assertion of the national identity, which is a, helps people feel secure, even if there are impacts of that. Yeah. So, but these are, you know, these are very, these are very weighty and uh, awful issues. And as I say, I don't have all the data. Mm -hmm. I only have my intuition. Mm -hmm. And my intuition is, is do not trust bureaucracies. They, they have their only tendencies to grow. Yes. Yeah. And the way you characterize Brexit as the true will of the, the British people, mm. um, puts it in the same light as our previous uh, comments about the Enlightenment as being a, 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 a blackout, I think you said it was. I yeah, mean, blackout, was, yeah. It was a it, shutting off of an entire faculty. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a... The, the people who are pro-Brexit or who are anti-Brexit think of the 
will of the people who voted for it as being benighted in some way, and yet you see it as the true will as representing some... Yes, I actually think a lot of... Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that if we really got down to examine individually the people who even voted to stay, hmm. uh, I think you would find that the, fundamentally they were confused about what, who they were, hmm. um, essentially. Yeah. So uh, it's, it was an assertion of uh, identity. Yeah. feeling of being overwhelmed by uh, an alien uh, mm -hmm. force became quite visceral for ordinary people. And that's what's swung it. The economic arguments, you can swing whichever way, depending on who you're talking to. Yeah. Um, I, I would have thought it sounds a good idea that you can make your own trade deals with the world, but uh, we did that before the 70s. And, you know, it wasn't like we were flying high <laughs> in the 60s and 70s. I, I mean, I don't trust our lot of bureaucrats any more than any other group. Yeah. Uh, in any way, the betrayal, the betrayal of the English interest has been done by our own bureaucrats. The, I, the civil service in, in the United Kingdom has simply taken on um, the laws as provided by Brussels. And I think it's been very convenient for them. And I don't think they fancy losing that, mm -hmm. that job being done for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you, th this term, the true will that you use, is a term yes. that you take from Alistair Crowley, about whom you've written two or three books. Oh, uh, yeah, and the fourth now, coming up. Well, he was against he was against his era uh, that he was brought up in, as I am against mine. Mm. Um, I think that's an artist's job, in a way. And he, he was brought up in an era that... I guess, artistically speaking, at least, would be thought of as the, the modernist era. And Well, you know, when he started, his poetry was, was very well received. I've just transcribed an interview with Crowley done in 1903 by Marcel Schwab, uh, who was a, a Jewish intellectual writer, journalist, and of great distinction. And this was before the Book of the Law. Hmm. Uh, and Crowley had just come back from K2. Oh, hmm. Sorry, no, from Kanchenjunga. No, no, K2, K2, that's, that's right. He was just come back from the assault on K2. And he's interviewed in La Presse newspaper, a long front page interview, went on to page three, about his beliefs and his mountaineering. And the French took his poetry very seriously. He'd just done a collection about Auguste Rodin, mm. uh, which Rodin himself wrote to him to thank him for, and he appreciated. He, he, he was regarded as a poet. It's only in England that his religious views uh, led to his poetry being immediately dismissed as it is today. Um, but um, he was very, he did very well in Russia when he went to Moscow, you know, he, he made, he made, uh, he made, he, he had a cultural simpatico relationship. Yeah. He was, you know, that thing about a prophet is not without honor except in his own country. Yeah. Uh, that's Crowley there. Yeah. yeah. This expression, the true will is a fascinating one. And, uh, it's not a common, it's not a common form of discourse today. And, and you could ask me what we really mean by it, yeah. um, if you want. <laughs> I, I was, I, it was one of the things that I planned to ask you because in so far as I understand it, it often stands for something that's contrary to your conscious will. Yes, uh, yes, that's true. And, and therefore the injunction that we should uh, live according to this will often involves a kind of mortification of the ego, I think. Yes, that's very yeah. true. Yeah, that's yeah. very true. Um, I think what Crowley discovered was that, this, that the common factor in all the mysticisms, and by that we really mean the Gnostic traditions, mm. of all the religions that he encountered the, uh, that, that we know much about, all have this idea that the, the ego is in some kind of conflict with our, our uh, deeper nature, shall we say, or higher nature, however you want to put it, um, that man is not uh, entirely of this world, the world that the reason perceives and space and time. And so there is this idea, I mean, the, the great idea of Crowley's was to identify free will with determinism. So if you're doing your true will, uh, you are the freest you'll ever be because you're living in conformity with all your gifts and talents and abilities. And at the same time, you are living with the full uh, power of the universe 
uh, and and the universal law of the universe so the it is the it is incumbent on a star to shine it is incumbent on water to be wet and to flow and all these properties and man he says that crowley's view is is the only living being who set himself up against his deeper nature and the original purpose he believed of religion was to put man in touch with his essential nature from which he's become separated and that's the whole theory of martinism and uh, the kind of hermetic freemasonry that was very popular in russia uh, for example um, in the late 18th and early 19th century until it was banned and the archimandrite of the orthodox church condemned freemasonry um, uh, as uh, uh, Illum I think the, I'm trying to think of the exact words, but it boils down to uh, Illuminism was, mm. was regarded as a, a sin. And you've got Tolstoy uh, criticizing it, I think, in War and Peace, if I remember. Pierre Bzuhoff has a little run in with masonry, but it, it, mm. if I remember right, uh, it's rather condemned mm -hmm. as, as being a sort of uh, fanciful irrelevance. But um, you know that's that's that. But but yes, I think this idea is is that man it does not know himself. Mm. This this is the thing, and that the progress of man towards greater knowledge on all planes, uh, inward and material, requires him to live in conformity with his ultimate being. Now, cr neither Crowley nor any other <clears throat> illuminist philosopher has ever thought that this was the panacea for all the world's problems because mm. it's perfectly obvious that um that we have an, an in, enormous variety in every generation of people who are to lesser or greater degrees in touch or not in touch with their nature and so forth or who mistake their true nature and so on and who's going to decide what's the true will of another it's an, it's something that this is the whole idea of initiation uh, if it isn't a self-discovered truth it's not the truth um so it's 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 in that sense it's uh, critical of the democratic idea that you can have a collection of people who in their collective wisdom are capable of deciding what's best for other people uh, in, the, in the way that you describe it as uh, both uh, free will and determinism it sounds very much like calvinist antinomianism you know the, the the idea that whatever you do is somehow predetermined and therefore you shouldn't worry ah, about i didn't it. say predetermined i didn't mean determinism okay. in okay. in the sense that the future is is predictable no because the the it's the degree to which you would be in conformity with your possibilities um okay. it isn't predictable that people are going to be so the the there's in, enormous uh, scope for random events i think some people have who get into this way of thinking probably have a suspicion that uh, their life is in some ham is in some way mapped out for them. That they have a destiny. Mm. You know, but who's going to say, well, everything is predestined. Is this conversation predestined? Well, it's happening because you and I are following a certain kind of wavelength that's mm -hmm. brought us to, into this communication today. So, uh, if, if, if you knew all the factors, you'd probably be able to calculate that we would almost certainly be talking. Uh, but whether tomorrow, next week or whatever, yeah, or whether you've got a cold and couldn't do it and all that stuff. So, no, I don't think it's, I don't think is there's anything particularly Calvinistic about Crowley. Yeah, yeah. No. No, that, that makes sense because you had, you had previously kind of put him in conflict with the, uh, the Protestant mainstream. Yeah, he had not. He had very little time for the Protestant. He had more sympathy for the for those religions which allowed uh, for, um, I suppose, mysticism. Frankly, mm -hmm. he was quite keen on uh, uh, Molinos, uh, the the who was condemned by the Inquisition, the the Catholic mystic. Uh, he he mentioned him quite a lot. He was very open-minded. He was very Catholic. He he, had, he did not he did not ever come up with a philosophy which he thought other people should take on and unless it was in conformity with their own capacities it's it's highly individualistic i mean to me it's the most individualistic religious philosophy ever uttered uh, and that's why i i personally believe it will become inevitable that uh, ver versions or something very much like it uh, if unless we 
retreat into the cave will, will, will eventually uh, become much more current. Mm -hmm. I, I saw, when I was a, in my teenage years, I, I, I wanted to save the world, of course, and I wrote a, a piece called Decentralization and the Age of the Individual. Mm -hmm. And I wrote this in the midst of a Labour government in the mid-70s, which seemed to be absolutely determined to destroy the individual. I experienced it at school. When I said I wanted to go to Oxford, I was said, oh, Churton, you always want to be different. Why you? Yeah. you know? And a lot of people are destroyed by that, yeah. you know, that pressure. Yeah. Uh, luckily, I had a very, my, my parents uh, were free thinking enough to, uh, to resist the, the tendency of that period for collectivism which was manipulated by the media hugely, I think, yeah, and yeah. is coming back again, I'm sad to say. Yeah, it is. And, and so um, I, I've heard you mention in the past that you had thoughts of becoming a clergyman yourself at that period. And, and For sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah I thought, I, I, I'm a great believer that theology is the queen of the sciences. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I know what I mean by that. I, I, I would say it partly to shock uh, some people and to annoy there is a there is a real tendency in great britain particularly in the sciences to regard all religious questions as scientifically meaningless hmm. uh, my view is that uh, only a great religious visionary uh, has the capacity to discover new scientific knowledge okay. uh, but i would define a religious visionary not as a believing churchgoer or anything like that but simply somebody whose mind was open <laughs> Okay. Well, <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, this brings me to the question of magic, which is uh, uh, something that Crowley is known for. And uh, when I talk to people on the subject of magic, obviously, you know, most people who come from the materialist paradigm that we were discussing at the start of the conversation dismiss it as, you know, a relic of the the, uh, the pre-modern period or as something that recommends itself to, you know, uh, people who are not very well educated. Yeah. But when I talk to people who identify as magicians these days very often they you know they they, uh, they talk about it as maybe a way of uh, harnessing some of the laws of physics that are not well understood yet or um yeah i mean I, yeah, there is a, there's still this tendency in in the yeah. occult world to try and get uh, points for occultism by tying it in yeah. with contemporary scientific knowledge i personally don't take that side of it very seriously it doesn't matter to me whether um science comes up with a theory that i can relate it's like the quantum physics thing you can you you to 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 the poetic mind there appears to be um a breakdown of materialism mm. in the in the quantum evidence mm. but it's perfectly possible to present the quantum evidence entirely in a materialist uh format and i've, I've heard that and it, this is really about interpretation. I don't think that science is going to come to the aid <laughs> of okay. occultism. And okay. I don't think science wants occultism to come to the aid of science. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you say, I believe in magic in the Crowleyan sense, by that he meant the original wisdom when it was a conceit of early Freemasonry or the, the thinking part of it, that mm -hmm. the original science and the ori original religion were one. So that is a very important principle and that that has become apart and particularly come apart since the 17th century. Mm -hmm. um, so when we, we get on with our own business, I mean, I don't see why you can't be a magician and a scientist or mm -hmm. not. It really doesn't matter. They're all, you know, there are either things that you know and you know how to do them mm -hmm. or not. You can approach science as a, mag as a magician or you can approach it in entirely materialist terms that's, that's your state of mind that you bring to it uh, magic is about in, expanding the consciousness i would say uh and harnessing the 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 all the forces that are in your um compass and to it's, somebody who who occupies a completely materialist paradigm what would somebody who is expanding their consciousness in this way appear to be doing well, I suppose to a materialist uh, mind, they'd say they're either playing mind games in some way, mm -hmm. or they're or they're they're 
up their up their backsides with a sort of solipsistic uh, subjectivism. Um, anyway, they're getting they're getting a, far, a long way from from the nature of the discipline of science. It's it's a ve- it's a it is a very awkward situation we're in at the moment with this these arguments. Since science started to preach science as an alternative to religion, mm-hmm. which is the way it's taught, I think certainly in British schools. In other words, this is what you need to know. Yeah. Um, I think that has been that that it has in effect. Beca- I think science is, has become a religion, and and it's become an intolerant one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it 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 pres- presumes to dictate over things which are not within its compass. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, God is not an object of our knowing, and so cannot be subjected in any shape or form to to a scientific analysis. You can only you can think about God if you want to, and you can you can have ideas about God, some of which may be more uh, uh, fruitful than others. Um, but you, what you can you cannot possibly uh, prove. Uh, the metaphysical uh, conception of things it's it's just not within the grasp of our instruments okay uh but you know i as i say all that i feel i'm just falling again into into quite uh, into a kind of pattern of conflict which i'm not sure i'm i'm really part of at all i don't have a problem with science i have a problem with people who claim too much for it that's all i see um but i don't but I also wouldn't say that magic is is, uh, is unscientific, um, but it does deal with mostly powers of the human mind, um, and in that sense, again, you, how do you put the mind under a microscope? Well, I, I mean, I've studied quite a lot of psychology, and um, it's obvious to me why behaviorism has become the dominant. Uh, scientific force in, in, in certainly in British psychology because you can observe behavior and you can if you want to attribute it to a cause you can do that um, so it appears to be more scientific and this idea that something has to be more scientific for it to be truthful mm-hmm. this is where I'm again I want to say mm, that's not the whole I don't that's not the whole story for me at all I don't like intolerant um, uh, intolerant worldviews, and I think uh, the the modern scientism, as some people would call it, scientism, has become increasingly intolerant. But when I made a film about doctrine in the Church of England for Channel Four back in '87, I interviewed the leading astrophysicist at Sheffield University, who had r- written a book about the Star of Bethlehem mystery, and he said, uh, you know, he's a, he's a Christian believer, absolutely, and he said, he said to me, he said. What I'm doing as an astrophysicist is nothing, he said, compared to what a theologian should be doing. He said, understanding why comets decay is really trivial. Trying to understand why human love and human contact decays is extremely complicated. You know, so uh, there, there, he wasn't a scientific scientist. He regarded science as, 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 a, as a God-given tool for understanding and working with the the powers of creation and in that sense science is a branch of magic in actual fact and certainly it owes its genesis to magic uh, historically who were the who were the who were the remarkable you know it's amazing most of the claims made for science are not made by scientists they're made by philosophers Hmm. you know if you actually when i was at college again all the chemists tended to be evangelical christians whereas the biologists tended to be atheists and the physicists couldn't make the minds up (laughs) which again is very very interesting each kind each aspect of science attracts a different kind of mind if you look at zoology for example people um and i was thinking britain's david attenborough who's you know always on television giving his 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 philosophy and airing hours and hours and hours of it a day um, he studied the, the reproductive habits of every living creature on earth and he's a fervent uh, opponent of any kind of spiritual conception and he, 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 I would say intolerant as well not intolerant to the degree of wanting to repress physically 
uh, others. But I, I, I can well imagine, uh, who did I meet? David Wolpert, I remember meeting at uh, Jean Gampel's salon. And when he heard that I'd been writing about the Gnostics, he went like this, get, a, get me behind me Satan. You know? yeah, yeah. I said, look, which one of us is superstitious? <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know, there, there's been a huge fact for right? mm. writing about Gnosticism in the in the academy in the past few decades from mm. by people who basically regard it as a you know an artifact of an earlier time. But you, you're one of the few people I've met who operates with at least one foot in the academic world who writes about Gnosticism as somebody who is, I think, maybe an insider to it in some way. Um, yeah, if you if you, you follow this. That. Current, if you follow these these new neologisms like emic and etic, yes, yes. Uh, uh, if you feel you have to, I don't. I think they're uh, rather unnecessary terms. I think uh, we, we can use ordinary language perfectly well. It's it, it, Gnosticism to me is is somewhat personal, mm. um, for two reasons. Why the re I'm not particularly a a, 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 a proponent of second century. Um, Greco-Egyptian theories of the origin of the universe. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not. I don't take them materialistically or, or as or as science. Although by the science of the time, they had something to commend them. And there's a great deal of intuition in the early Gnostics, which ought to arrest our imagination. The mm -hmm. idea of the Big Bang, which is so common now, in fact, is pretty well what the Gnostics are talking about. The universe is a kind of uh, explosive, uh, chaotic, uh, semi-chaotic. Uh, semi-chaotic entity is very Gnostic. Now, where did they get this intuition from? Um, and we are finding the, the physical extension of space more, becoming more and more hostile than the 19th century liberal would have it. The clockwork universe of Paley and, and the, the 18th century rationalists has disappeared. Newt, Newton's kindly um, machine of the universe um, although if that's only one part of his theory, of course, but that that has gone. We're we're finding it's a sort of stinky methane-filled uh, place, which has seems to have very little purpose other than to other than to pursue a kind of curious expansion or contraction or waving about. But it doesn't make a lot of sense to us. But it can be studied, and you can collect data on it. I'm sorry, I've I've actually gone away from your original question. Can you remind me of what, what, what you're yeah, saying? I was, I was wondering how you got away with being a, a Gnostic in, I think... Yeah, uh, because I think that for me, the Gnostics represent the, 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 a truly spiritual interpretation of um, the gospel, of the Christian message. They are spiritual in the sense that they are fervently anti-materialistic in their outlook. What matters, what, what is savable from mankind? What is, what is essential? What is substantial about man? What is, the, what is his uh, uh, essence is for them spiritual. Now they've been called dualists, but I, 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 I've never been happy with the idea of them being dualists. They didn't all hate matter. They saw the material for what it was as a concretion, rather like when light hits, thicker density material, the light becomes distorted. Mm -hmm. As things are brought more into manifest being, or we'd say into, into some sort of uh, uh, material universe, whatever, however we define this word material, um, there is a diminution of essential quality. And, but, but nevertheless, there, it is present. There is, there is in the universe uh, something, some light that we can come to, to work on. Mm. Um, and our ability to do that in the Gnostic um, frame of reference is to have the light, spiritual light, come alive in oneself. And so that's the key thing, is true, is spiritual enlightenment. That's, what, that's the salvation. Um, that's what gets us out of the, either losing ourselves in the reflection of mm. uh, our ego, um, mm. And it, ra it raises us higher. You know, Jesus said, ye are the light of the world, ye are the leaven of the bread. It is the, it's the Gnostic impulse that takes man out of the cave. I believe that Gnosis is the key and always, always been the key to, to human progress in every sphere, music, painting, poetry, science, the lot. So it, it, to me, it seems to me to be the religion that's 
still to be my next book if if it goes ahead it has a working title the religion of the future Are you it's conflating uh, gnosticism with platonism when you well you you uh, can't take the platonism out of gnosticism sure okay um but you don't have to be a platonist to be a gnostic crowley didn't like platonism mm. uh he didn't he didn't like he didn't like this the idea that there was a real distinction between uh, an intelligible reality and and nature mm. that's one of the really distinctive things about his philosophy which i, I find very attractive because he keeps waking me up and saying don't slip in too far into platonism you know uh, or we'll we'll just be thinking about running away <laughs> you know? um crowley gives real value to to the fullness of the of the natural universe in every sense what we do with it is what makes it interesting we bring meaning to it we won't find meaning in it mm -hmm. we bring the meaning when i listen to uh uh, Dawkins and and the the whole selfish gene crowd, uh -huh. and they 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 say, but I can't find God in the universe. They say this is the main cry. Yeah. I can't find God in the universe. So well, that's not where you're going to find it. Yeah, yeah you've you got to, if if you can't if you haven't found what we call God in yourself, you ain't going to find it anywhere else. It is an enlightenment of the mind. The whole to me, the essence of religion is perception. It's about the eyes to see. It's about becoming more of able to envision, take on more. There's that wonderful William Blake engraving he did um, of a man standing on earth. This was done in about 1792. And the caption is, I want, I want. And he stands on the earth and we see a ladder all the way to the moon. Mm. I want, I want. Mm. Now, here we are before, you know, um, nearly 200 years before Apollo 11, he expressed that what man desires, he can achieve. He doesn't need reason to tell him what can be achieved. He has this capacity to desire, the long de désir, as, uh, as Saint Martin put it. This is, this is the kind of man we want. He, is, he has his full imaginative capacities working. Before the science comes the vision, before the, before the fact comes the dream, the dream doesn't come from, from a rational process. It's, it's a spiritual thing. And we get inspired through poetry, painting, music, and the spiritual capacities of man, which remind us of this, this paradise that's always slightly out of touch. So the, uni the universe to, 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 the, to, the, to the, Gnost the, true, the Gnostic of today is, uh, is just a fabulous opportunity. But it, we have to see it also for what it is. It, we require, man is becoming de-elevated um, by concentrating too much on his existential plight. Now, the other great thing about the Gnostics is they described perfectly the Sartrean nausea, you know, of Camus. The existentialism of man stuck in a universe of no meaning is precisely what is described in the Gospel of Truth, as it's called, the Valentinian work mm -hmm. discovered in Nag Hammadi near about in 1945. Um, the, the Gnostic has no, no, doesn't need to be told about the misery of life or the despair of existence or the horror of mortality or the cruelty of mankind or all these things which have depressed the, you see, the person who's been depressed most by the 20th century is the enlightenment type of person. Mm. It's the rationalist who's so sad he's become cynical. This yeah. is, you know, they're the people who are disappointed because they had a ludicrously Rousseau-esque view of man and still do. I listen to the Labour Party particularly still believe in such utter nonsense as the equality of human beings, whatever that's supposed to mean. I don't, I don't know what the hell they mean by it because I see no exact, I don't, even <laughs> on a scientific level, it's total nonsense. There is no equality. Uh, no, there is, there is tremendous diversity. Yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. who knows what gifts that that child is born this afternoon is going to bring to the world don't predict what that child's bringing could be something incredible so you're you're not talking about the inequality of classes but you're talking about the incommensurability of individuals would you say yes if you like i mean i you know, we've inherited we've inherited a system uh which was uh really faulty because good people were kept down Hmm. But uh, so 
I think the sort of general idea of the meritocracy is one which I uh, want to see uh, re-erected and finally, but but beyond, but much more beyond its materialist setting, i.e. it's, you don't, the idea of merit being rewarded, for example, by money mm. or wealth, uh, all the great people I know in history, while we've all enjoyed wealth, money, facilities, etc., and facility is, is that which expands your freedom to do. Mm. Um, you can't reward enlightenment with money because its price is uh, far above rubies as the pro proverb says. Mm -hmm. So again, it's the materialistic idea of class which is the problem. And of course, how, who has power over whom? Um, obviously, a person who knows something has power over somebody who doesn't know. Immediately, you don't have to do anything. That, that You've already got the extra vision. A man who climbs a mountain sees more than the people living in the valley. Mm -hmm. um, so there's always going to be hierarchies of perception. The aim is that you, you, you bring forth the good people. Uh, those with the potential, you look, you look for their true will, and you bring it forth. So your education system is all about finding the true will of the individual, not about placing people like the, the I think the uh, synarchic concept behind the EU, which is a very static kind of society mm -hmm. that they, yeah. they, they seem to want in the EU. Uh, you're looking for God in man, basically. Yeah. And you're saying, what you've got, we want, and we want to develop. You know, it's cultivation. That is the meaning of culture, to take wild nature into culture. The more enlightened the culture, the more uh, progress, the bigger yield you're going to get from the field. We want to increase the yield of human uh, capacity. So yeah. that, to me, is what Gnosticism means now. Yeah. It's a completely different idea to managing people, which you've got in the materialist concept. Mm -hmm. or rewarding them in the in the most obvious and sad ways you know i i do think people get something when they go to india and they actually see contrary to what they have been told that people with very little can be truly happy mm -hmm. it, it it's it must annoy some people <laughs> but it's a, it's it's a living fact um people don't get their happiness necessarily from being stuffed with uh, with privileges you know, it's yeah. the, the tr where does happiness come from? This is what we have to look at. I think it comes from a realization of your own talents and sharing them with other people who also are realizing their talents. And we, you know, we create this great army of God. You know, we, we, it's, it's, it's not a utopian system. You're going to, people fall by the wayside all the time. Uh, one of the things about Plato's uh, utopia or his his ideal republic is that he he's very pessimistic about the number of people who can be uh, philosopher kings or who can be enlightened in the way that you describe or who in Trollian terms can realize their true self and uh, therefore he he kind of implies that the uh, the ideal republic is doomed to fall apart and uh, like when I look at modern liberal ideals of equality I tend to think that they're a sort of a debased attempt to make everybody into a philosopher king. And I'm wondering whether Crowley thinks that we'll all that a society is imaginable in the future where everybody will be able to realize their true self and be, you know, a, a philosopher king, as it were. No, um, I think that's why you have the line in uh, the book of the law: "The slaves shall serve." Uh, this wasn't. This obviously was appeared long before uh, Nazi hmm. uh, slave camps, or he certainly wasn't thinking about the uh, people. Uh, being pressed into building railways in the tundra and all the rest of the, the enslaving of people what he meant by what is meant by the slave shall serve is there are always going to be people whose whose happiness and and uh, security is through serving other people hmm. you know that and that's that you not only recognize but you value highly yeah. yeah you know what the last thing how many philosopher kings do you need when it, it comes down to it well, as many as are born is the answer. If, if, it, is the, if it is the destiny of a person to occupy um, through his consciousness or her consciousness this role, then who are you, who can, who, who are you to stop them? This is the point. Uh, but it's certainly not everybody's uh, uh, will in this world to, to, to take that role. People, now, people who believe in reincarnation, and I'm not one of them, but I do appreciate the idea that uh, some lives are lived 
with another life in the future in mind, as it were, of which this life has to be lived first for some spiritual reason. Mm -hmm. A lot of people believe this. It's a, a, a feeling they have. I don't have it in the sense that I don't, I can't think that I was ever another person. So I don't have that view. Maybe I'm too egotistical. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I do feel I've, I am somehow been present in all history. I, I do participate in a bigger being than Tobias Churton, 19, born 1960. I'm already part of something bigger. So the life you lead will give to the whole picture. So no, you can't, you can't, yes, this idea that everybody should be, go to university and all this sort of thing. It's, 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 it's on the same level as that everybody is a noble at heart. Uh, this isn't true. We know that some people are quite savage, uh, meaning by which we mean cannot be civilized, cannot be brought into a culture successfully. Some people can't be from all different kinds of backgrounds. You, you could be could be the son of a you know king or a prime minister. There are there are people, luckily not seems to be less. I don't know. Hard to say. Um, you, you've got to have some sort of filtering system to, to, to stop the rot that is yeah. inevitable in a society. Look, in, their fa in any family, there's always, you know, two brothers. One will do this, another will do that, and yet they've had the same parents, grown up in the same village, town, city, yeah. you know, and they could become completely different. One will become, a, you know, that's... So there is something about you, you, you are here to live the life you're here to live. And it's not for me to say what that life is. Yes. Uh, Cro Cro Crowley's ideal is a kind of, uh, it's a sort of aristocratic notion of you have the people who are sworn to, who have seen through the materialism, who have sworn to serve uh, the higher will. And mm -hmm. those people uh, will dedicate themselves to the the management of, of this this sort of thing. There's a sort of slightly platonic concept there, isn't there? But exactly how society will shape, or the idea that you should have an ideal society, I'm not even sure you should. Um, I, I see society as being like a, a, a work of art that's constantly being made hmm. and it, it changing according to the needs of the of the of the of, of the of the whole group. Mm -hmm. um, I don't like, I, we, there is a tendency to just knock the word liberal. Let's remember what liberal used to mean. It meant being generous. And it's okay. a noble thing to be generous. Yes. It's not automatic. You can't expect it. You can't write it into the law that people should be noble. Uh, we know that in any given situation, some people will be real heroes save others and other people look entirely to their own fear and retreat mm -hmm. you know so you can't have a society I, I i'm against the liberal valuation of society if it means that uh, everybody must be treated the same and everyone could everyone could be a millionaire or everyone could be a duke or everyone could be a king or everyone could be a politician this is i mean who's to say whether any of these uh, ideas are the, 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 beg, the beggar maid may know more than the prince. Yeah. Yeah. Who's well, to liberal, say? What yeah. is it to be a ruler of yourself? Does it mean, uh, you know, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't denote where you would be in society. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's expand, we got to, I mean, we, I think we're really in the early stages of human development. I mean, mm -hmm. when I hear people talk about post-historical, post-modern, I think this, this is nonsense. Where we've hardly seen the shoots of what human beings are capable of. Yeah, you know? yeah. I know so much about my own family history. I, was, I took my daughter to a village in Cheshire, where uh, William and Alice Churton were married in 1604, and she said, "Well, what's that to me?" I said, "Well, that's your great 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 grandfather. That's he's there. That was 1604, and in 1604, uh, they believed that when you went out of the uh, terrestrial realm you meet angels and that was the universe and I said if and then she said well how many lifetimes is that and I showed her how little time has passed mm -hmm. really and 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 the human perspective is too too small so um, there's this terrible tendency in scientism today that we're on the verge of total knowledge yes. you know, we've, 
Yeah. I don't see this. I don't see that at all. I, I think we've, we've, we are, we have experienced since the 17th century an amazing amassing of uh, data and uh, revelation of nature. I mean, it's it is fabulous, and yet it's very interesting that the hope and expectation of that that I remember as a child in the 60s has turned quite differently today. People aren't looking outward at the moment. They're they're sort of looking. They're becoming part of the micro world. They're looking inward. Um, maybe there's been too much knowledge too soon. We go, can't, people can't deal with it maybe at the moment. Or, when you say the micro world, you mean quantum physics and that kind of thing? I, in, I mean, everything that's gone small. I'm mean, talking about iPhones and, and yeah. uh, seeing, you know, I, I, I've had a cinema constructed because I wanted my daughter to see that you don't, a film is not something that's one inch square where you can't actually tell where the camera has, has moved or anything because yeah, yeah. you can only see the dominant shapes. As if you want to see art, you go to a gallery where you see how big these wonderful paintings were. Don't look at them on a phone. That's what I mean is, is um, I remember writing in 83, the computer cottage is an, elect is, an elect <coughs> is an electric prison welded in the fear of vision. I could see a time when we're doing what we're doing, sitting in places communicating, uh, but not physically communicating. Our world is becoming... Uh, micro in that sense and I think our minds uh, may be becoming uh, narrower too. Yeah. Books certainly are becoming less uh, read at the moment in, in Great Britain and I'm sure that's true of most of Western Europe. Yeah. Um, uh, the inability to concentrate for long, 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 a long time yes. um, or pay attention. We know there's ma massive problems in education to do with it, today with attention deficit as they call it. Yeah. Inability to sustain you know, or even listening to people speak to sustain an argument or anything. So things getting smaller, things getting tighter. And there's a uh, fatalism on the part of university administrators about this as if the tide of technological development were unstoppable and we should resign ourselves to the emergence of a new form of intelligence based on our distractibility, our infinite distractibility. Well, that just goes to show you how unimaginative yes. uh, university administrators have become, and that, yes. which is probably why I'm not, uh, I don't want to be in a university particularly. Yeah. Uh, because I never found, even Oxford, you know, I never found a university where, where I thought it was a really expansively free environment of the mind. Yes. I find that they are, in fact, uh, competing schools uh, with all kinds of under, underground aggression going on. The subject which we brought to Britain, uh, Western esotericism, yeah. is not taught in a British university now because uh, at Exeter University, where the course was set up by um, Nicholas Goodrick Clark, he died very suddenly. Mm -hmm. And this was the opportunity for those in the administration to, uh, to uh, put the pressure on to uh, make sure that that's, that subject was no longer going to be covered under the Exeter University rubric. So I've had a very direct experience of this, the ama amazing imaginative skills of our university administrators. They, their, their rhetoric is amazing. You know, they, we're open to the world. You know, we send men and women out into their, all this stuff. And yet, you know, when ordinary people meet university students, they usually have to listen to a barrage of <laughs> didactic, you know, bits and pit, tidbits they've picked up in their three years when they're not drinking and shagging you know so, <laughs> the five minute they the essay they wrote thanks to the internet and and all that and i'm not saying of course i'm not talking about all students by any means uh, or anything like it but uh i am i'm amazed at how how pleased with themselves uh, universities can very quickly be like any group they're talking to each other and they're under the impression that they're a kind of supermind uh, of, of Western culture, whereas I just see them as the current schools of thought. Uh, uh, I think know. a lot of academics are leading lives of quiet desperation, though. I mean, I think they... Well, it's not enough. Yeah, it's quiet. Yeah. 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 Very few of them believe this rhetoric, but they have to sort of... You play the game and take the money. Play the game. Yeah. You play the game and take the money. It's not the benefit of esotericism that it is a marginal uh, activity or that it takes place you know, out of the limelight of... Uh... Well, they, it's really, it's, of course, I mean, I would have lo loved to take it back to Brasenose College, my old college at Oxford. Mm -hmm. It was ideal place, Brasenose. Elias Ashmole, founder of the Royal Society, magician, mm -hmm. astrologer, natural scientist, was enrolled at Brasenose during the English Civil War. Mm -hmm. um, 
Brezhnev was founded as a bastion against the uh, against humanism. Okay. as a religious institution. And now I don't think there are any theologians there at all. And when I was there, I think there were about three of us. Okay. But it was actually designed, it's paid for and still paid for by the bequest of, of the founders um, to promote uh, a religious teaching. That was what it was founded for. But if you go there now, it's dominated by lawyers and would-be journalists, you know. Uh, that's mm -hmm. the, that. And science is everything of course so if i took if i wrote to the principal and said well i'd love to come and teach West, uh, western esotericism at my old college I, I i i could predict almost exactly what i would be informed if i was given a reply you know yeah. we are a modern university <laughs> we don't do that sort of thing uh, this is not a subject that uh, it's uh, you know you can hear it come forth but i th a lot of people who study western esotericism get truly inspired about life uh, and and I don't know what they go on and do. Some of them go on to write more Western esotericism books. But uh, I, it, it was fascinating to 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 teach that subject for for the during the first decade of the. Do, do you feel an evangelical vocation when it comes to esotericism, or do you think that people? I occasionally, I occasionally those? feel I I should you know do something. <laughs> yeah, so I, do, I it's it's. I felt much more evangelical about the whole thing when I was in my 20s and I went into television and we did the Gnostic series mm. and I gave up a lot of my life to, to get that material out. And it, I know it affected a lot of people and the, the book, the original book did extraordinarily well. But you know, the moment it came out, it was like that was the end of my career. I couldn't get any work. There was such a prejudice against it. Yeah. Um, it was like, how, you know, how did that get through? Well, I know how it got through. It got through because of two people. John Randler, who was the commissioning editor who got so sick of channel four that he went to become head of danish second channel and jeremy isaacs uh, before the day before michael grade came in he had a, a very open mind and had a real belief in what channel four could do you took take those people out and somebody said in the daily telegraph we we'll probably never see a series like this again you know and they won't it's not been shown yeah. since people have to go to great efforts to to, to see it but I, I, I went into television with, a, with a, a zeal that if you showed people the light, <laughs> if you could let them to see it, then, you know, that you, you were doing all you could, of course, but, uh, but, but the truth would be recognized. But you find that it doesn't quite work like that. What they needed was a, they have to, people have to develop a diet of something before they, it becomes natural. And, you, I, I watched one of your lectures where you were talking about the the uh, the disappearance of of of, of um, Platonism and the Epicurean. You, mm -hmm. you were talking about materialism as Epicureanism, which is yeah. interesting to me. Uh, I'd always associate the Epicurean more with the sensual uh, side, uh, the pleasure yeah. of the flesh. But of course, that that comes with it. Yeah. That comes with it. It's probably that's the, that's how you get it. That's how you become a materialist. Is you <laughs> you become an Epicurean first. You know? Although you know the Epicureans were very much into moderation rather than into Epicurean self-indulgence uh, mm -hmm. in the in the colloquial sense of Epicurean today. Well, as you say, the colloquial sense is is very yeah. different from. It's like the word Stoic, of course, is a completely different uh -huh. meaning yeah. to to our, our yeah. Stoic friends. Yeah. But um, yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm interested in why you yourself are, are sort of making a, a statement about, I mean, are, are, are we just, um, as they say, peeing in the wind? I mean, are we, are we, are we just, you know, is, is... Um, I don't, to be honest, I don't know. I mean, I, I started, I, I started doing this kind of thing, reading esoteric works and reading various other works of alternative spirituality out of sheer boredom with the materialist paradigm that I was educated in as a PhD student. Right. And I, I started trying to write stuff that would get accepted by academic journals and to kind of smuggle in a little bit of esotericism. And I had huge difficulty getting published. Like it, it took me all, all the uh, all the articles that I read as a as a newly minted PhD in my first academic job, I just, I could not get them published for the life of me. I eventually did get most of them published, like after trying for maybe six, seven years, but uh, not all of them in, in academic journals. So I don't know. And by that time it was too late for me to have a conventional academic career. I was never going to get tenure. 
and um, so I've just sort of ended up in Siberia by a series of... <laughs> it is, this, yeah. There does seem to be a, a, an extraordinary poetic logic about that. I mean, is that where you end up these days if you, if you, yeah, yeah. If you don't buy into the, in, into the yeah. common dream? Yeah. Um, did you ever think when, when you were facing this resistance to your ideas that, that there was a kind of a spiritual conspiracy? Or, or do you think it's just sheer ignorance or what? A spiritual conspiracy? You mean a conspiracy on the part of... Well, uh, a kind of mental tendency that's developed has become a kind of egregore. It's just it's, it's, it, that people are actually afraid. You um, know? I, and I, that this I, fear can be ignited in people very quickly. I, want, I, I mean, I'll give you an example. I went... Um, I was making a little film with Nicholas Goodrick Clark, who was, you know, double first from Christchurch. Mm. And we, walked, we were in the Museum of Science, of the Museum of the History of Science in Oxford. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wanted to film John Dee's uh, Holy Table, which they had on display there. Mm. And um, this, of course, was originally Elias Ashmole's museum, the first public museum in the world, mm -hmm. developed by one of these strange alchemical Gnostics. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was the first public museum in the world and the first chemical laboratory in, in a British university he also had put in there. They had an exhibition that discovered our chemical flasks downstairs. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we wanted to film in there and there was a, there was a bit of furore. The guy came down from upstairs. I said, oh, yes, well, you're doing this film. Yes, I said, so could you just tell me what it's about? You know, he said, well, we're, we're interested in John Dee and Elias Ashmole's interest in alchemy. He went back upstairs and he came, somebody else came down and said, uh, uh, we can't possibly uh, accommodate uh, uh, this kind of nonsense in a, in a, 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 a museum dedicated to science. Well, yeah. And we were basically given the bums rush in our own university. Yeah, but the, I think so. Something, but it was the nature of the of the of the rejection. It had a kind. There was they were frightened. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'm not privy to what the thought processes of people. I was trying to get uh, essays published with, <laughs> were, but so I, I put it down to the fact that they just this was not something that they recognised. It didn't fit because academic journals tend to be in very traditional pigeonholes, and if you're not writing within. Uh, a particular specialism it's first of all hard to find journals to submit to and if you yeah and if, if you're not writing in a way that's recognizably within that specialism people just put you on the slush pile immediately I think it is difficult I'm, I'm working at the moment with a, an academic uh, what it's called a seminar run by a professor in Michigan uh, and it's it goes under the rubric of theology really mm. And in that field, you can do something on these lines. Uh, and in a way, I'd have preferred, instead of trying to push Western esotericism as a new subject, it would have been much better if the theology faculty had developed uh, within itself uh, a capacity for those subjects. I mean, yeah. fun funnily enough, the first book that really hit me on the subject was I found in Pusey House Library, which is the old Anglo-Catholic library in, mm. in Oxford, one of Francis Yates's books. Uh, yeah. I almost felt they got it in by accident. <laughs> I, yeah. I noticed I was the first person to get the book out. Um, it but it, gateway drug to this as well. Pardon? It was my gateway drug to this. Uh, really? Yeah, yeah she's she yeah. Did, well, exactly. I think you've got it. She's the gateway for a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and because she managed to keep on the right side of the system just mm -hmm. long enough, just long enough. But when I went years later, when we were doing the TV series to the Warburg Institute, where she was mm -hmm. a fellow of, if I recall, yeah. um, and I spoke to the new guy they'd got running it, he's long gone. Uh, and he said, oh, well, of course, yes, <laughs> Francis, yes. Um, well, of course, we don't really encourage that sort of thing anymore. Um, why, why not? Well, you know, um, it's a bit, uh, it's, 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 I, I, mean, I, I think a lot of people have done a lot of research on this. And I think, I think the, the, this over the blanket notion that science owes something to magic, it's just not something that we, we want to, we want to promote. I mean, we, we, we're interested in looking at, at medieval sources, but within their own context. I mean, we don't, we don't you, know, you know, you can hear it, can't you? You know exactly what yeah, problem. Yeah. So they've got, and of course, the, they've been, poor old Warburg's been struggling 
Mm -hmm. uh, it's got all this, it was founded by Abby Warburg to be a beacon for this mm -hmm. kind of material, but they're kind of, because it's part of the University of London, they've had to kind of hide, hide their light under a bushel. Mm -hmm. um, but I think uh, Gerald York knew what he was doing when he left the, his Crowley collection to the Warburg. I think that was a brilliant stroke. Okay, I didn't, I didn't know that was there. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah, she was, she was, she's very important. I think, um, I think the interest in this subject is palpably growing. Yeah, okay. I don't think Britain will be the first to, to, to it could have led in the field. It's, it's, had the, it's had the pioneers. But I mean, you have got Amsterdam, you've got Paris, mm -hmm. and I'm just waiting for a decent American university to, to, to get on the bandwagon. I think it's a matter of time, yeah. frankly. I, there's, there, I mean, there's some sort of related things like the California Institute of Integral Studies or the, the, the Rice University has a, uh, an interesting uh, religion department where they, it's not esotericism precisely, but they're a bit more open-minded about esotericism. They're more into, uh, I don't know, forms of new age spirituality derived from Buddhism, I think, but you know, they, they, uh, do, you they do some interesting think, stuff. Do you think you could get a Western esotericism faculty in, in Russia, the Russian Federation? Uh, I don't know. Um, Used to be the, the, you know, you think of the IP to, uh, Turnikev, was it? Uh, and the, the Topographical Association, 18th, 19th century, they published nearly every Rosicrucian work in Russian. I mean, the brilliant work they did. Yeah, yeah. And it was a real fount for it. I, ha I have some colleagues who are interested in esotericism uh, as sociologists, but I, I don't know if there's anybody who's interested from an emic point of view. Um, if, I've, I, if I've got the right one of those two terms um my book on that you showed me the gnostic philosophy one is translated yeah. into russian yeah, um, no, i think there's huge interest within russia in these subjects but whether they'd make it into the university system i don't know i mean i think the university system is quite materialist and uh, uh I, I yeah except but, in siberia <laughs> Well, in Siberia, I'm smuggling a little, little bit of it in by doing this podcast, but in my academic work, I have to uh, continue to play the materialist game for the most part. Right. How do, how do the students uh, take to your, um, your incursions of, of esoteric knowledge? Um, you know... Uh, Are they, they mystified they or...? Been, they haven't been too, too subject to them too much. I, I, you know, I, I, I teach St. Augustine, and that's maybe the closest I get to... Uh, illuminist philosophy and, and the kind of thing that we were talking about earlier in this uh, in, in this discussion because the particular university I'm in it's uh, I teach in the core curriculum for the most part I've also taught a course on depression in literature where I talked about materialism as a kind of loss of meaning uh, associated with the enlightenment uh, where I did talk about these ideas a little bit so yeah I mean I think there's probably a minority of students who are uh, interested in these kind of in, in reading literature uh, in a romantic way rather than in a, uh, a way that opens up to uh, contemporary gender and race politics and that kind of thing. But I, I do think they're... Uh, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit surprised. I, when uh, the, at the beginning of the revolution, there were quite a few members of the, uh, uh, the Secret Service. The, what, what, the Ogpu, was it Ogpu before KGB? Um, the... Uh, I forget the I forget the, uh, and the Cheka and so on. But there were there were figures who thought that the the revolution would release a, a kind of spiritual illuminist. Um, of course, Stalin finished all that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the, it was actually around even then. There was I mean Crowley wanted to go to Moscow, um, and wrote to Walter Duranty, who was the the American news correspondent. He said, "Do you think they're ready now for for Thelema? Because yeah. this is a this is a, a a a religious conception that does not require belief in God, uh, or you know." He, he thought, yeah. you know, and Durante writes back to him. This is 1930. He says, "He says whatever whatever you may be thinking, I don't think Russia, uh, the le current leadership in Russia is not in the well Soviet Union." I forget what, what date they become Soviet Union as a title. It wasn't immediate, was it? But anyway, he so said that it, that's not going to go down well at the moment with the leadership. I met Madame Prokofiev, which was fascinating, a few oh, years yeah. ago, yeah. Um, you know, who'd suffered under the, the old uh, Soviet regime. Mm -hmm. And I started talking to her. It was at a salon in, in London. And uh, I was talking about spiritual things. She said, well, that's what we, would, what we believed in, in 
Russia in those days. We believed that there was that what mattered was the spirituality. It was it was becoming alive spiritually. It, was, it wasn't a particularly religious idea, but it was something that my husband Sergei, the the composer, was trying to bring to his music, or, and through his music. And it was a, spirit, a spiritual awareness. She said it was, it was mainly in the way our relations with one another, our care for one another, our respect for one another, our, our interest in each other's depth of being. And uh, you see, I think that would resonate very powerfully with young people today, that, that approach to spirituality based on relationships and creative partnerships and, and uh, a shared concern for your that your 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 fellow and, and what text would uh, would focus those questions best in a classroom what text yeah interest i don't know uh, it's an interesting question isn't it um do you say you do literature yeah that's my that's what my degree was in yeah have you seen my book occult paris because i wrote uh, that I, too. I that's i haven't read it i've seen it online yeah Oh, I think you see there's so much in that because that, that's where I, I take the whole artistic ferment of 1890s Paris and show exactly how it's thoroughly uh, esoteric and not rubbish has been sort of because of the First World War and the growth of surrealism, that, that amazing period, of, I think, 1890, 1910 is almost become invisible but it was a spiritually hugely creative period. I mean, in Russia, you had Kandinsky, mm -hmm. and uh, Kandinsky's quoting uh, from Josephin Peladin, mm -hmm. and saying, he's given me the key to spiritual art, putting the spiritual in art. And it's, and it's, a rev it's, a, it's, a, it's regarded as a revolutionary movement because mm -hmm. it's, it's to liberate the canvas from, uh, from pure representation into platonic idealism. Yeah, yeah. You know, you, you are after the intelli you're in symbolism, the intelligible world. Now, that book might be, or, or books that are mentioned in there, or any of the novels of Peladin would be of interest. He wrote a whole series of popular novels on magical themes. A book that I've long wanted to find an excuse to teach by a Russian is um, uh, Meditations on the Tarot. Do you know that book? By no, who wrote by, that? It's, it's by a guy called Valentin Tomberg, and it was written... It was published anonymously after his death. He was a monk who wrote this. I mean, it's it's a, an esoteric Platonist. I've got the ideal. I, I look. Yeah. I'll put you in touch with Christopher McIntosh. He lives in okay. Bremen, yeah. and he speaks Russian. Okay. And he's familiar with Russian literature, and he's written about esotericism in Russia. Yeah, and yeah. He, he's he's extremely much more interested in fiction than I am. Mm -hmm. Um, and he'd be a, a, somebody who'd be very happy, I think, to come over and, and talk. And I think people would find it very interesting. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, we'll he's take, quite a character. Yeah, I'll take yeah. you up on that. Okay, so um, I, don't, I don't want to keep you too long, but uh, can you just say uh, in, in in closing what you're what you're writing now and what what we can expect from you in the future? Yeah, well, at the moment, I've just had a book out just this month uh, called "The Spiritual Meaning of the '60s." Oh, yeah. okay. um, I just did an interview in America, went across the country and Canada. Uh, they have 8 million listeners a week on mm -hmm. this show called Coast to Coast AM. And basically explaining uh, the 60s as a spiritual event, as a, spirit, as a spiritually meaningful time. And mm -hmm. I discuss in that, the, obviously, all the things you'd expect, the pop music, the cinema, um, American, British, European, as much as I can. Uh, but it's also about you know the the the, the zeitgeist. Mm -hmm. uh, this I call it the super push button robotic space age. All of that um, ultra modernism and futurism that you get in the sixties, and how that also reflects spiritual categories. So that that's out now. Now I've got another book coming out on India uh, at the end of this year, which is uh, I've just put the finishing touch to, which deals with the entire range of Indian religion. Uh, in terms of its uh, esoteric spiritual meaning in the context of Alistair Crowley's time in India uh, between 1901 and 1906. Mm. And uh, I, what I wanted to do through the story of Crowley and his exploits and his learning and his meditation and his amazing success with Raj Yoga and Buddhist trances and mountaineering uh, is to show 
in clear terms just what all this stuff about India is. What, what do we mean by Vedanta? What is Advaita? What are the basic concepts and how do they relate to Western uh, esoteric ideas? Because uh, there's a very close tie-in, um, which hasn't been, hardly been really made clear. So if you're into George Harrison, you want to know what, what really he was reading, uh, because I do find if you, the trouble with if you just start reading Hindu or Buddhist literature, you're always only reading one school of it. And the, the tendency is to overload you with terminology that you can't relate to your own reality. Yeah, yeah. So I wanted to put a real clarity, you know, drop that thing in, suddenly it becomes clear in, the, in that book. So that's called Alistair Crowley in India. Okay. And then after what I'm thinking, at the moment I'm working on um, Enoch as, as an academic project with the Enoch seminar, uh, which will be meeting in, on the continent later this year, 50, 50 uh, professors from around the world discussing the book of Enoch, okay. uh, which I think is formative of Christianity mm -hmm. and Gnosticism. Mm -hmm. uh, amazingly important book. Uh, so that's my academic thing for the year. And then after that, I've, I've got this book called the, the Religion of the Future in my mind where I want to sort of see profitably where things could go. And that's basically the idea is that if you take the esoteric tradition of, of, of Christianity, Judaism, Islam, but also of uh, secularism, hmm. uh, uh, secular humanism, and you, you put all of this esoteric interpretations, first of all, I'm not doing a theosophical job. I, they're all the same mm -hmm. while respecting yeah. the traditions. Yeah. Can we see very clearly again where they connect? And if they connect, uh, uh, if they do synthesize, does, that si does the synthesis suggest a new thesis that mm. could seize the imagination mm. of the thinking, spiritually alive part of the world, if there is one in the future? <laughs> you know, uh, I think Ken Wilber uh, just published a book with the same title with his vision of the religion of the future. So I must change the title. Then. <laughs> I, mean, I think it would be very interesting if you both had the same title or if you were, because I think you'd come up with very different visions of the religion of the future. Mm. Yeah, I don't, I'm not advocating a religion for the future and I'd not, I'm certainly not predicting that such yeah. a thing could happen. But I'm just looking sure, about, sure. well, if we followed these lines, it could come out that way. And really, I'm trying to suggest that we do do that. One of the tragedies of the world at the moment is we're going to get in the, the major religions have committed a kind of a philosophical suicide, it seems mm -hmm. to me, over the last 50 years. And yeah. that they have nothing to tell us that yeah. challenges the worldview of the yeah. present. Um, the Church of England, certainly, as I discovered when I wanted to be a vicar in it, simply will accept anything science comes up with and and modify accordingly yeah. and you know the, many of the theologians have accepted that god is dead and they're content with a social uh, ethical system they'd like to give advice to people in power what a what a come down what a what a what a sad position for the augustine's great uh, kivitas day to find itself being used as a as, as a as a consultancy body I mean, it's tragic uh, failure of vision. And of course, I would say it is because the church has rejected its esoteric gnosis that it's found that it's ended up in this situation completely uh, um, vulnerable in the world. I mean, Catholics still get by on miracles. They're, 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 they, they have the largest uh, subscription because they believe <laughs> totally against in the face of science, they're still believing in the providential acts of God. And that's what keeps them going. Yeah. I, I would think it's probably true in, in the Orthodox situation as well. The miracle of the church. Uh, yeah, it's not very clear that the uh, Catholic church has much of a future here in Ireland. Uh, I keep thinking that you're in Russia. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, well, of course, Ireland had too much, has had too much of it. In every sense, it's had too much religion. And, you know, it's, that's what was pre pretty well happened in the Reformation period. People had had too much of this stuff. Yeah. And, and especially when you find out that your teacher is trying to get into your trousers, it doesn't mm -hmm. help matters, does it? Yeah. Yeah. But uh, 
too much too much religion is uh, is not a good thing mm -hmm. um it'll be very interesting how that develops whether you know the the, the catholic church is finished as a as a dynamic historical force yeah um Obviously, if you've got a religion that's mostly represented by the least educated people in the world, mm -hmm. well, that was probably true also of the late Roman Empire. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it wasn't a philosopher's choice yeah. uh, that Christ crucified. Um, however, I suspect uh, in the in the techno te in the technocratic uh, world of today, it, it, it's a re it's a real problem if your religion has nothing to say on these matters, or yeah. little to say, yeah. but above all, it fails to inspire the young, the new generations. I mean, yeah. this whole thing is about inspiration. My experience of new generation, my daughter's generation, is that they are ripe for being inspired. And they're having to put up with some very low level inspiration. I yeah. mean, I think of Corbyn appearing at Glastonbury last year. I, I, yeah. I, I'm, that was a disgrace in my opinion. Um, mm. it, it was like that was the, is, is that what you're offering? <laughs> Outmoded, outdated, totally discredited, you know, late 19th century, sub-economic nostra of, of you know that don't work shown to not work yeah. cannot work will not work yeah. and that's what you're giving the people i mean was it, it would his father give his son stones for bread you know uh -huh. don't yeah. they deserve something better than that surely they go to a place like glastonbury to find something better i don't know whether any of their pop stars uh, uh, today have much to to inspire yeah. them with and they they're being entertained but they're not being inspired they do seem to be offered alternative materialisms rather than anything that uh, lifts them above that paradigm it's true it's true but and young people are most uh, have have this capacity to be lifted uh, it, whereas w my own generation is now suffering from sclerosis of the conscience mm -hmm. thoroughly and uh, once that process has started as you yeah. as you know will have observed this there's no stopping it <laughs> why am i laughing it's tragic but <laughs> it's uh, the, the, one of the strange things about the, this whole philosophy is it gives you the objectivity, if you like, or the view. I don't like the word objectivity because, you know, objects, is that what we're talking about? Yeah. Uh, but when you have the view, you, you can laugh at things, but you, you're also laughing at your own part in it. And it's, mm -hmm. it's the great danger of disappointment leading to cynicism. I don't think we must try for that not to happen. It's It's... It's, I think cynicism is the, really the rot of the formerly optimistic. You know? Yes, yeah, uh, I agree. The cynics tend to be uh, disappointed idealists. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And therefore, one shouldn't be too idealistic. I've, I've always kept these two things, the, the, the ideal, the real, mm -hmm. um, which, of course, in Gnosticism is, makes for a pretty complex. Uh -huh. you know, I'm always kind of thinking in two ways yeah. of, of a better thing. Yeah. Uh, common sense is... Is, uh, is is a spiritual gift as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. My, my old kinsman, Dean Ing, uh, who was a mystic uh, theologian, it said, reason is a gift of the spirit. Mm -hmm. I wish we'd recognize that. So well, it's a very important way of seeing it. it. It shouldn't be this, there should be no conflict between reason and the noetic, or netic, if you like, capacity uh, or the spiritual mind. There should be no contest at all. They're not, it's not intended that way. The gift of reason is a gift also, but it's a, it's, it's a gift from above. It's, mm -hmm. if, it's when reason fails to realize that there is something beyond its roof. Mm -hmm. this, is the, this is where the, that's when the enlightenment became the blackout, when they closed it off. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's a, that's a, that, that's a, a pithy way to, uh, to, to end the conversation. Um, thank you very much for agreeing to do this. It, it, uh, I, I'm very grateful for it. And uh, I hope it hasn't been too disappointing for you, John. No, it's been, it's been very, very illuminating for me. Right, well, anytime. <laughs>